can't make it. You just have a note in your screen telling you that. Right, my name is Russell Smith. Uh, I'm a director of the Scottish Crofting Federation and past chair, and I am chairing this online Zoom seminar, webinar, Zoom event, whatever you want to call it, on from Croft to Kitchen. So it is, as we are discussing there, it's about local food and how more possibly how you sell it, how you produce it, and the format of the evening is we've got five people who are actually doing it, and they are each going to take about 10 minutes to tell us their story. After that, there will be opportunities for questions, discussions, uh, either particular questions to the, the presenters, or just more general about producing food, selling food, marketing. Uh, we will, if you don't mind, keep the questions to the end because interruptions in Zoom don't work very well. And if you do have questions, if you can pop them into the chat room, you'll find the bottom of your screen mark chat, type something in, then it's there for posterity. If it's there, we can pick up on it later. Uh, or when we get to the end, just raise your hand, again, use the electronic um, signaling thing and that puts you to the top of the screen so we know you have a question to ask. And we'll say that could be to a particular presenter or a general comment and we'll use our panel then as, um, as our experts, fill in some of the background. Uh, general Zoom etiquette, which you'll all be aware of by now, but please be on mute if you're not actually speaking, because that cuts back the feedback and makes it easier. Uh, right, that's probably all on that. Um, I will just make a couple of comments to start us off. And the first thing is that, you know, we are talking about producing and selling food locally. We're not defining that because it will include selling directly to customers, selling through farmers markets, as we're talking about there, selling through local shops or selling stuff over the internet as well, which works for some people. So there are different ways of doing things. You have to decide what works for you. And if we're just thinking about local food, then if there's benefits for yourself in that, you make money out of it that's the whole point of it we're trying to to be economically viable so we can keep living in crofting areas and living on crofts i certainly found that the local food the food production side of it and the direct selling actually complemented very well our tourist businesses and our main business which is store labs But again, if you're selling, the benefits to you as a producer is that you know you direct contact with your consumers, you're getting feedback from them, and that helps you to improve. For the consumers, they're getting good quality food, they're getting perhaps a, maybe not a variety of food, but a different food from what you might get in the supermarkets, and they know where it's come from, they know the provenance, they can talk to, to you as a producer. So that's all benefits for them. And there's also benefits for the environment. Generally in crofts, we're in a, if not organic, we're in a low input system. So that's good for the environment, it's good for biodiversity. And as we've learned from COVID, that anything to do with local production helps community resilience. Support our local communities, that, that helps when we get into pandemics or wars in Europe all these other shops to the system. And finally, personally, as I was saying to Joe there, we used to do the Ornac Farmers Market, we used to do a lot more direct selling than we do, and it was always hard work, but by doing the markets and things, we did make a profit from it. The social side of it was great, you talk to consumers over your stalls, you talk to the other stall holders, all of whom most of whom were interesting people. We made friends through that. And I found there was a great deal of satisfaction. 
difficult from producing new food and from selling it directly and getting your feedback and people telling you that, oh, this is good, they enjoy it. So it's got a lot going for it, but we'll hear in more detail now from our presenters. And first we're going to Jake, who's got a market garden in Glenelg and will tell us his story. And if you can, all the presenters, try and keep it to 10 minutes, then we'll get through all this in about an hour, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussions. So Jake, over to you. Hi, uh, uh, can you hear me all right? Great, that's good. Um, I have got COVID at the minute, so my brain's a bit foggy, so if it all starts drifting and sounding a bit rough, just uh, wave at me and I'll try and get back on track. Um, right, I'll just try and share my screen. Uh, okay, can you see the photo? Yeah, great. Um, oh, hang on. Started by itself. Um, so, um, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Uh, trying to go through the slideshow itself. Hang on a second. I might have to just do them one by one. Sorry, bad tech. Um, okay, um, so my name's Jake. There's a picture of me, uh, which is fine. And I run um, a small market garden called Cosay Growers with my partner Kate, who you can see on the left there. Um, so I suppose the first admission I have to make is that we're not actually crofters. We don't uh, have a croft. We've got a small farm, um, but it's all intents and purposes. It's similar. It's sort of generally um, quite hard ground to manage. Uh, yeah, we're in a remote part of the West Highland. So although we're kind of imposters, uh, we still got invited on here to talk. Um, and Kate also has COVID, so she's hiding in the next room, uh, feeling sorry for herself. Um, so we both um, work part time uh, on our market garden. Uh, Kate runs a cafe um, a few miles down the road, um, and I do a bit of work in the village uh, as a landscape gardener and uh, work on the local ferry. Um, and then, yeah, probably about half our time is spent on the market garden, and the other half is working, uh, yeah, on the on the land. Um, so, um, wherever are we? We are in Glenelg, um, which is on the west coast. Uh, a lot of you might know it. Um, here's a photo of the land that we have. Um, so we've got about four hectares of land. Um, most of it is northeast facing, uh, which is, yeah, as you might know, not ideal ground for growing on. Um, it's all quite steep, so you can see in the background there. Um, yeah, there's a lot of the ground is, yeah, is very sloping, quite inaccessible. Um, yeah, we found ways around that. Um, very acidic soil, um, which is a challenge as well. But we're sheltered from the big southwesterly, so we don't really get much storm damage, um, which is good. As you can see, we've got a, a wee greenhouse down there. We put that up fairly confidently um, because, yeah, because we just don't get hammered from the, from the big southwesterlies. And we're in a small community, um, which has a very sort of strong tradition of crofting. So we've got access to a lot of local knowledge, um, which has just been totally invaluable for helping us get set up. Um, yeah, a lot of people have helped us out in various ways. And we've also got access to a lot of local materials. So we get, you know, sheep's wool, seaweed, uh, manure, yeah, all sorts of things, which will help go into improving the fertility of the ground. Um, yeah, and making our, our veg better. Um, so that's where we are. Um, um, so on the crop um, or on the farm, uh, we grow veg. Uh, that's our sort of main main activity. Um, so pretty much all of it is grown outdoors. Um, we've got that small greenhouse that you saw and another even smaller one. Um, yeah, we've decided to do that. We've had experience with polytunnels over here on another farm locally. Uh, several of which blew down and it seemed to us like it was a lot of money and a lot of plastic um, and we'd give it a go growing outside um, which we've done pretty successfully we've learned yeah different varieties that grow well outside we've learned when you can grow things when you can't grow things uh, there's often more time when you can't grow things than when you can grow things but 
we'll kind of try and grow intensively in the months when we can. Um, yeah, and we um, so we've got permanent beds um, that we sort of adopt a no dig approach. Um, so we don't use sort of big uh, plastic ground cover. Um, yeah, we do a lot of mulching, add a lot of compost, um, and generally try and build the fertility of our soil. Um, and in not digging, we don't have too many weeds, uh, despite what you can probably see in that photo. They're fairly manageable. Um, yeah, and yeah, the bed seems to grow really well because we've added a lot. Um, into the soil. Um, so we grow veg. Um, hopefully, I don't know what's happened. We also grow flowers. Uh, the flowers photo has disappeared. Um, yeah, we grow a lot of different flowers, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. Kate's more the flower expert, um, but as I say, she couldn't be couldn't be dragged on here to um, yeah to talk about it. But I'll talk a bit more about flowers um, in a minute. Let me go back to that. And we also grow a lot of fruit. Um, so I mentioned we have very acidic soils. So that's perfect. We've got that, uh, the acidity, the pH is about 4.5, um, which is perfect for blueberries. So we've planted up a lot of blueberries, which are coming into their third, possibly fourth year for some of them. Um, so they're just starting to produce abundantly. Um, and we've got plum trees that you can see here, and they're interplanted um, with the blueberries. And then we've also got apples, which we grow mostly on cordons um, sort of along the south facing fence line that we've got at the bottom of the slope. Um, so we're using the bottom of the slopes quite a lot. because There's a lot of, yeah, the soil's better there and it gets more sun and it's generally more sheltered. So we found they're quite good places to grow. Um, and we've also got a lot of black currants as well. Um, and otherwise on the farm, we, uh, we run workshops. So this year we've been doing some workshops with the local school. Um, which has been a really good way of getting, yeah, getting the kids up here, getting locals involved um, and also getting a bit of extra income. And we've also run some workshops for the public. Um, I suppose the scale at which we do things, which is very small scale, um, is often quite applicable to people who are growing things on allotments or in their gardens. So we've had quite a lot of interest from, yeah, people like that to come along and see what we do and they can, yeah, hopefully take some knowledge from us and, yeah, bring it back bring it back to what they're doing in their gardens. Um, sorry, this is a very uh, uh, slow way of doing things, but there we go. Um, so uh, what do we sell and how do we sell it? I guess our main, um, yeah, our main sales at the minute are um, of the veg, just through veg boxes, which we run in the summer months. So we go between roughly mid-June to late October, depending on the year um yeah so we grow um yeah we grow enough to sell between 20 to 25 boxes a week um which we sell very locally like probably the biggest distance we sell is 10 miles and actually the majority are within two miles of where we are so it's an incredibly local very captive market um yeah quite small like we yeah um yeah we'll hit the sort of roof of the market quite soon but that's kind of working for us at the minute um yeah our veg boxes you can opt for a small medium or large veg box and we deliver direct to the door um and yeah people sign up for uh for a whole season um we did start by having an email list that we just sent out weekly what veg we had available and people sent us back what they wanted and it was an absolute nightmare um we spent probably 90 percent of the time coordinating who wanted what and 10% of the time actually growing the vegetables. So we ditched that and went for, yeah, just sign up, you get what you get. Um, and actually, I think everyone was happier. A lot of people didn't think they'd be happier, but people have been able to be more creative with what they've got. Um, yeah, I think people appreciate that, you know, what's in season is gonna be, you know, is gonna be the best. It tastes better than out of season stuff from supermarkets. Um, and we've had really good feedback on the veg boxes um and we also do uh direct sales of our veg um so we've got there's a village shop oh there's another picture of some veg boxes in the back of the van kate said it looked the van looked too dirty to share it with everyone but i think it's all right so there you go you get to see it um and yeah we sell uh direct to the shop um so yeah there's a some spring onions and sugar fat peas all packaged up um, which are ready to go off to the shop. Um, and the shop and the pub 
and Kate's Cafe, and there's a couple of other local cafes. Um, we sell most of our project uh, produce out of season. So when we're not doing the veg boxes, all of our produce goes to these places, um, and it's great. It kind of keeps yeah keeps our sort of name out there. People are really into it. Um, yeah, like where we are, as I imagine a lot of you are, is really remote. Um, so there's not good access to yeah sort of fresh tasty veg. Um, so this kind of keeps yeah keeps it in the community. Um, <coughs> uh, we also sell flowers. Um, so Kate does most of the flowers. Um, so we sell fresh cut flowers, um, which we sell as an addition to our veg box. Um, so we've still kept a bit of the complication of sending out a weekly email, um, and um, yeah. Um, and people can buy through there. So I've just seen that I've been talking for quite a long time. Um, and we also sell dried flowers, which are great. Um, so we yeah, cut them in the season and Kate dries them and then sells them at markets. Um, yeah, uh, Christmas markets and online. And that's been a really good way to spread the selling throughout the season. So we're obviously really busy in the summer months growing veg, but it means we can make a bit of money out of, uh, yeah, out of those times. Um, and we also sell the fruit, um, yeah, through the veg boxes and locally. Um, yeah, there's some more flowers. And um, yeah, so finally, very quickly, sorry, I've got over my time a little bit. In terms of the viability of the business, uh, we do make money on it. Um, so we made, um, well, after our outgoing to our sort of um, profit last year was about £3,000, but we work probably for six or seven months of the year without selling anything. Um, so there's a lot of work. Um, so in terms of our hourly rate, it's pretty abysmal. Um, we are, yeah, we're hoping that all the fruit that we've planted will be bringing in a, a much bigger income in the future. So we'll be doing, yeah, more direct sales, possibly online sales, um, and the flowers as well should grow in that respect. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and we have a sort of lifestyle that's great. Um, we grow all our, most of our own veg, uh, so we feed ourselves. Um, we've got a nice place to hang out. Um, yeah, and it's uh, it kind of it works for us. But I think without our other jobs, we yeah we'd struggle financially. Um, but possibly as a result of having other jobs, we haven't put as much time and energy into making this a viable business as we might have done. So it's kind of a bit of a you know. Um, uh, I don't know, two sides of coin as it were. Um, yeah, I think that's mostly mostly me. I hope that's all made sense. And yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. That, that, that was great. Thank you, thank you, Jake. Uh, a couple of points before we move on. One, I think your your branding and the packaging of the stuff looks very good. It's quite classy, and that's it. If you're using the same theme all the way through, that. That seems to work. And the other comment I would make is that never work out your hourly rate. <laughs> and uh, I'd never do it again. It's just, it's just too, yeah. You, you, yeah. I, do, do, do it once and then never again. I concur with that. Yeah, definitely. Top tip. Okay, thanks, Jake. Uh, Beth, now Beth will now. Uh, Give us her presentation, Beth's got Croft in Strathnairn and lots of local food and yeah, mainly beef, but other things as well. And she will now tell us all about it. Beth, here you go. Thank you. I will just hopefully set up our screen here. And that should, can you all see the presentation. Excellent. So as Russell has said, so my name is Beth um, and my husband Tim and I run Birch Woodcroft. Um, Tim works offshore so this does affect how we manage our craft. Um, I used to work for the NHS but I've been off. Um, I was off for five years um, for having two mini crofters. Um, although I have recently started just being self-employed and working for the Crofting Federation. Um, but otherwise, Tim and I are the sole employees of the Croft, and we'll maybe not go into how much we get paid for the work. Um, we are about 14 miles 
south of Inverness. We back on to the Monolith uh, Mountains. We are at about 280 metres altitude, which does affect our growing season. Um, and the croft itself is 35 acres. Um, so we run a bit of a classic, um, a little bit of everything. Um, we have currently a mixed herd of um, 17 uh, beasts for the cattle. We've got sheep and bees. Um, we usually do a couple of pigs each year. Um, they help dig up um, a bit of the ground for us and then we can send it off for pork. We do have a little bit of old woodlands um, and we've planted about 5,000 new trees. Um, but otherwise the rest of the croft has been split up into four different fields with our main field, which you can see in the bottom left picture being our hay field for getting hay for the beasts. We do, on a horticultural point of view, we've got a polytunnel, which is a seven and a half by 13 meter polytunnel. We've got a veg garden. Um, we've got a small orchard, so it's just got 17 fruit trees um, in it, um, which we get, well, it's a variety of fruit trees. So we sell a variety of produce from the craft. The main thing being beef. Um, we send off usually two to four beasts a year. Um, the pork, um, we don't do pigs over winter because our winters are pretty harsh. So our pork normally ends up on our menu board in the autumn, which helps bridge the gap between when we're sending beasts off. Um, all of our meat goes to Macbeth, who we pay extra for to get vacuum packed and they do all our labelling for us. We sell now, it's all individually priced um, and we sell it frozen. Um, we used to do it in boxes and then we stopped that. Um, from the kind of the glut of the garden, um, I was always doing chutneys, but it was when we started doing a couple of community markets, I decided to make some that we would sell on just because I knew by having frozen meat at a stall, it wasn't gonna help get people in so I just did the jars really just to get people to look at our stall and it's ended up being um, quite good for having a produce um, available throughout the year. Um, we also have done honey um, although we are fairly I say new to beekeeping so last year we didn't get any honey so um, we don't bank our uh, livelihoods or our holidays on the honey. Um, the sorry for that. Um, we just last year decided to sell our excess veg. Um, we normally follow a little bit more of a self-sufficient uh, idea with the polytunnel veg garden. Um, but we often will plant extra seeds in the spring because we could well get hit with a frost. So we're always planting extra. So last year we decided that we would sell that extra because it's quite hard. Some things will keep, such as a squash or kale. The cabbage doesn't do very well. So we did veg boxes and um, we were inundated with people wanting them. Um, so from the veg boxes, we started in September doing them. As the supply went down, we then went to doing mixed boxes. Um, so that worked quite well trying to get people to do both the meat and the veg. Um, for it. We, because so many people wanted it, we ended up finding it was easier that I could just put a thing on Facebook to say, here's the amount of boxes we have, and it's a first come, first serve um, basis. We often would put into the boxes um, a little info sheet so people knew what veg it was, um, say the reasons why it was that one, and um, what to do with it. Um, we are on um, QMS, so the Quality Meat Scotland and the Scottish Crofting Produce Mark. So we found that was a good time to tell people, in a sense, the reasons why um, we were on those. Um, and just to help people understand kind of what we were doing um, for making that food. For selling our produce, um, we 
do all of ours direct to our customers. So they either come and collect it or we more likely or more commonly, we do local deliveries. Um, we are a mile and a half up a dirt track, a very pothole filled dirt track. So it does affect who's willing to come up and collect um, their food. Um, we put up all the info about uh, what the produce is that we've got on our website. Um, I manage it, which is why it's not always working smoothly. And then our other main um, site that we use is Facebook. I have sold meat via Twitter, but that was a one-off thing. Um, and I don't, I don't quite understand why that one, but Facebook works quite well for having it pinned to the top for what we've got um, available. We have we have done market stalls. Um, the pictures here are of our community market, our local hall, um, doing them. Um, it's great for if you want good crack with people. Um, we do sell quite a lot on the day, so it does give a good turnover. Um, when we calculated the amount of work involved for getting a gazebo, freezers, and the setup, um, it's not worth really looking at. However, it does help just getting to know people or people getting to know us and what we do, because that's when they can ask the questions. Um, and chat and I would say one of the other things that we recently found very helpful for selling meat particularly is our card reader. Oddly enough we had kept on cash and bank transfer for quite a long time but have more recently found um, the card reader is a huge benefit for the, getting people to part with their cash and buy uh, local food at our farmer's market. Um, so the kind of question of do we um, make a profit in a sense? Um, the income from our, uh, from the, well, not just the meat, but the produce, and we do calculate if we sell livestock, um, it does match our expenditure. So that's obviously the straw, vet, um, livestock, fuel, etc. cetera. Um, it doesn't cover, in a sense, the capital investment. Um, so we have done quite a lot of work. We got crafting grants for our hay field to help obviously get the hay for doing the cattle. Um, things such as it doesn't cover building a hay shed or the tractor. Um, but at least we say that's, in a sense, a capital investment that um, because, in a sense, Tim working offshore, we can invest in that. And we also see the benefit of just using um, the land. Um, so for the kind of question of does it fulfill um, what we do, the Croft does pay for itself um, and it allows us a lifestyle that we can enjoy. Um, we can work the land, um, we can work with nature um, and it allows us to give well, to eat like kings, really, and get the kind of high quality food that we can share with other people. We sell all of ours pretty much to locals. We've only, I think, once sold to a tourist. Um, and it gives you really good stories that you can pass on um, to other people with it. So, yeah. Yes, thank you, Beth. Uh, yeah, good, good presentation, lots of nice photographs there. A couple of points I picked out from that before we go on is to say if you're doing market stalls and having tasting stuff always works, draws people in, they will try it and then they feel embarrassed enough to buy something. So that helps. But your point about the card readers is probably well made. We, we never bothered with that and I think that Certainly, we're selling meat and higher price stuff. That's probably essential. So, thanks for that. Uh, we'll now go on to Anna and Hanno. Are you doing a video? Is that the plan? You were, I saw you were still there. Um, yes, we're going to do a bit of both. I've got a video and then um, we've got a presentation as well. Right. Um, uh, okay, tell us about West Coast Organics and Sky. 
Okay, so I was supposed to be putting the kids to bed, so I'd made a video beforehand, but um, then they didn't get to bed. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but I still think I'll show, I'll share the um, video just because it shows you around a bit. So, um, can people let me know if they can hear the sound on this video? If I press play, here we go. Along with my partner, I've lost the sound there, Anna. Is that better? I think it's playing through your speakers and then your microphone's picking it up. There is an option on Zoom that you can allow um, the playing audio, but I can't remember what it is, sorry. Well, if people can hear it, we can just leave it and we'll just not talk. Or is there, fee is there feedback happening? I with can't really, I can barely hear it. No, I can't, I can't make it out. Okay. Hmm. Um... Do you want to try muting Anna and try playing it and see if that might help? Well, I did do that at first, and then Russell said that he'd lost the sound completely, so it seemed like it's, um, yeah. Yeah, I think we lost the sound because it was just picking up from your own speakers, if that makes sense. There is an option on Zoom. I'm really sorry, I'm not very helpful because I can't tell you where it is. There is an option where you can enable the sound in the video. Share sound. Share sound through the... Yeah. Um, okay, we'll go back a bit and let's see if this works now. Um, so uh, we have a 12-acre croft uh, on the northwest of Skye near Dunvegan. Um, and you can see behind me there's Pool Roag uh, and our croft runs right down to the sea. It starts off um, up on the hill land and then it's a long thin strip like uh, lots of crofts are and it runs from that hill land uh, through quite a few different fields and then down to the sea um, and we've got like um, about an acre behind me that's um, that's market garden um, and that's where most of our business comes from like we do do other things on the croft but it's not uh, that don't really make us any money but this does make us money this is our uh, our income uh, comes from this croft so uh, and the market garden so I'll show you um, around a bit um, and then you can ask any questions if you've got any questions. So, um, so we've got um, what we've done with this acre of land is um, when we arrived, it looked like those fields over there, uh, just completely bare uh, land that had been grazed. And we were, came here six years ago, and we've planted uh, shelter belts of, like as you can see there, of willow and poplar. And then as we move across, we've got these beds. We put a track in, and we've put these beds in, and then we've got um, hedges mixed. Hawthorn hedge, black hawthorn blackthorn, and lots of other different things in it. Um, and we've got two of these hedges to sort of separate up our veg bed plot. Um, and then we've got our boundary hedge over here, um, where we've planted more poplar and willow along that as well. Um, and that's really started to make a big difference to the amount of windage that we get. Um, on the croft, uh, those hedges, because we're pretty exposed location. You've got uh, the minch just out there and it does get really windy. Um, so we've got our veg beds. We've gone for um, 75 centimetre wide beds and 19 metres long. Um, and we've got four a four year rotation on those and they, so there's 21 beds in each rotation. Um, and so, We've got, um, what have we got? Let's go over here. We've got, this year we've got like alliums in this bed. So we do uh, onions, leeks, garlic, um, alliums and legumes together. And we do some runner beans and peas, but we've not put them in the ground yet. And then in this rotation, we've got our tatties and our curcubits, our outdoor ones, our courgettes and our pumpkins. Um, and then um, in this one, we're going to have, although we haven't yet done it, uh, planted much of this yet we're going to have our sort of roots and leafy things um so 
and then further down we've got our brassicas so i've just walked down the hill but i paused it um and we've just planted out a lots of kale we get quite a problem with cabbage root fly so we've gone for like this method of like hooping everything and then putting this uh environment over it which seems to be like making quite a big difference to our crops um at the moment so that's us now at the bottom of the veg beds um and if i turn round then we've got a hedge this hedge was actually already here when we uh, arrived and we've got the uh base of the shed that we're going to have because we haven't actually got harvesting shed at the moment and it would be great to have that so we're going to put that up in the next winter and then through this hedge um is our polytunnel area now we've um, built all these polytunnels we arrived here in 2016 and they went up in 2017 the big one with the polycarbonate on it it originally had plastic on it but um it two winters in a row the plastic went and so hanno really realized that we try this polycarbonate uh, sheeting on that and since then it's just been so robust um, and then it also meant that then in I think 2019 <clears throat> we were able to plant um, to plant no to build this shorter one um, which has been fine with plastic on it it's slightly shorter uh, height wise and length wise um, so um, and then we've got a little propagation tunnel although we I've sort of moved most of our propagation up to a polygrub that we've put up this year um, up at the house because it's got electricity sort of for heating stuff. So in this one, we're just sort of getting going with stuff this year. Uh, so we've got our courgettes, our tomatoes, um, and then we've got some cucumbers that are just going in. And then we've got our beds that were cleared for uh, French beans and some pumpkins and some more. Uh, curky bits and things to go in and then we've got some turnips which we so planted out in March time so these tunnels were completely full of stuff over the winter um, which has been going in veg bags um, for the last six weeks so we started doing a few spring veg bags we were doing 12 over the winter uh, sorry over the last six weeks we've been doing 12 veg bags um, but like most of the stuff that was going in them has now come out and we might need to have a little gap before the sort of stum summer stuff um, really comes on board. So, um, yeah, so that's most of a look around. Um, I've not shown you the, all of the brassica um, beds, but that's like the two polytunnels and then most of the outdoor beds um, that we do our veg boxes from. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very uh, much, Anna. Do, do you want to add anything to that, or your video? Um, yeah, Hannah's going to do a bit of the, uh, yeah, a bit more, if that's all right. Um, and is the sound coming through all right? Yeah. No, yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, as Anna said, we do veg boxes. It's the main part of our business. What are you doing? I'm just getting it so that you can see the screen. Yay! Sorry, that's the kid coming in to say Teletubbies is ended and the next one needs to start. Um, so yeah, we've got a five hectare croft, uh, just a bit more detail on what we grow in. Um, of that area is 1,250 square metres of veg beds and about 250 square metres of beds inside the tunnel. And we've also got a small orchard, which doesn't really produce much. <laughs> to be honest, it's a bit windy here. We cut a couple of 100, 150 small bales of hay for the animals every summer. Uh, we've got goats for ourselves and um, for milk and a bit of meat. And they create a lot of nice muck for the garden, multiple cubic metres after a winter inside. Uh, we're just looking into hens as a way to sort of fertilise the ground that we're taking hay off. And um, I think we probably will do hens, providing we've got people who are sort of signing up to buy the eggs every week so we're not left with lots of eggs in winter when people aren't having veg bags and we are just in the process of getting rid of our sheep because they waste an enormous amount of time and don't make us any money at all um so yeah the main part of our business is our veg boxes which it's all grown on the croft it's certified organic we do them for about half a year from june till december uh, just putting our prices up this year because they've been the same for a couple of years and so hopefully we'll do about £16,200 of sales from our veg boxes this year um, from our main season ones and then we always carry on for a bit to finish off the veg after um, up to Christmas for about 10 people and as Anna was saying in the video we've 
been starting quite a lot earlier this year, doing 10 or 12 every week. So our sort of shoulder season boxes for the really supportive customers who understand what a seasonal veg box is like in the spring with lots of green stuff and in the winter with lots of rooty stuff. Um, so that's a bit more money from veg doing another sort of 1500 quid or something like that. Then we've got our farm shop, which we started off last year. We pushed that on social media a bit and it did pretty well last year. We did about a grand off it and I think we'll do more from it this year. Uh, the big question is whether to invest in a fridge or two to kind of keep stuff fresher and make it less work putting stuff in um, every week. And I tend to find the veg box customers actually buy quite a lot of stuff as well when they come and collect their boxes. So that's our income. We do a bit of money to restaurants, but barely anything, 850. And we get a few subsidies. And yeah, the chickens this year will do about a thousand pounds. And we may extend that, but only if we have sort of guaranteed sales on the eggs. We don't want to end up with 50 eggs a day coming in and nowhere for them to go. Um, so all that adds up to sales of about 21,000 a year and a little bit of subsidy money. And uh, yeah, this is our main income for us. So we established this with our own cash, probably 25 grand or so over the years, six years since we've been here. We got the Young Farmer Startup Grant, which was an EU fund, which ran for two rounds of funding, I think, and gave away 2 million euros. So we were one of 70 people or something to get a 70 euro grant, which was 56,000 pounds. And then we've had some CAGs, the CAGs bought, well, actually the other polytunnel, Young Farmers bought this polytunnel. Um, yeah, there's just the two of us here, so I don't think there's the margin in this business for employing people. And also we feel like it might be a bit of hassle to have employees with us on site, although it would be fun, maybe. And we try to keep our outgoings as low as possible. We don't do any paid marketing. Anna does a bit of social media and we usually run a waiting list for the veg boxes, actually. So that seems to be enough. And we're back registered, which really helps us keep our costs down. Um, yeah, I stopped work last year, apart from we do one changeover in a holiday house. We were doing two last year and five the year before that. And I was also working part time and Anna was working part time um, as we built this up to the point where it could pretty much sustain us now. Um, where are we at here? Yeah, yeah. So. Guys, if you're trying to click your share your screen, we're still only seeing a still of the end of the video. Are we? Oh, right. <laughs> Thanks, Kirsten. Yeah, I was just about to jump in as well. This is very nice. <laughs> well, we've been showing you a presentation oh, as no. we've been going along. So we'll just have to share it with you and you can have a look at it because it's got, it's basically, I've just been saying what's on the presentation anyway, but it'd be nice if you've been able to see it. Can you see it now? Yeah, I got but, it now, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a shame. Oh, well, we'll just carry on with where yeah, we're at. we'll just carry on. Otherwise. Um, so we can live on such a, well, relatively small amount of money because we don't have any rent because we managed to build our house with some money from CAGS and we've been living in caravans for a long time, saving and a bit of family money and a lot of my time for nine months doing that. And so we can, yeah, we can do this because we don't go away <laughs> anywhere apart from seeing family a bit. And we have a low cost life, which allows us to live off this relatively small amount of money. But I mean, we also get a lot of stuff from the craft, like, you know, fulfillment and food and fun and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, go for it. You the last couple, uh, Hannah. Can you see this? Our expenses are really low. As you can see, there's a little rundown of them there. Well, this is our, you know, our running expenses, only a few thousand pounds a year. Um, we do end up spending money that we've made back into the business quite a lot. So our actual profit would be lower in any given year. But, you know, in theory, we can make a bit more than we do at the end of it. And, um, yeah, I think that's about, about it. I, I think this year we'll hopefully make £11 an hour. But that's before we start spending money on things that we don't have to spend, <laughs> don't absolutely have to spend money on for the baseline, you know, running cost of the business. And uh, so, yeah, that's our takeaways from this. It is doable. 
it's fun, there's lots of healthy food and family time, but it's quite precarious and it's quite a lot of work. And okay. sorry we weren't sharing our screen. <laughs> Thanks both of you. It's all highly organised, you say a lot of investment in that. To make a couple of points on it, one is if you have too much eggs over the winter, you can pickle them, <laughs> sell them over the summer, markets and things. We used to do that. And if you don't want employees, if you've got accommodation, you can get volunteers from things like Woofers or Workaway who will come and work for you for nothing if you give them board and lodgings. And in a nice place like Sky, you know, you have, you know people who want to come and help. Right, so we'll leave that and we'll go swiftly on to Joe, Joe Hunt on Strathpeffer. Thank you, Russell. Can you hear me okay? Right, I'm just I'm just gonna pop over onto a few slides for you. Um, although I think I've forgotten to share the screen. Hang on. Right, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, you go. got that right. OK, um, we came to the Croft 12 years ago, um, completely new to crafting. Um, I'm a consultant economist by training. Um, and if I was to advise myself as a client, I would be obliged by my Economics Institute to advise me not to go ahead with this business. Um, that was my starting point. Um, I'd never done any farming before, um, although we did have a wall garden and were supplying a restaurant uh, in Cromarty for, for, the, for the while. Um, when we came to the Croft, the Croft had been used predominantly for annual sheep grazing lets for the, about the last 30 years. Um, and we were on middle red sandstone, so the, the, the soil's pretty good, um, but a lot of a lot of it and there'd been no reseeding or, or liming or anything for a long time. Um, and three of my neighbours, um, all in their 70s then, all in their 80s, um, kind of set about trying to show me a few of the basics. Um, so this is Neely McDonald um, showing me how to plough. Um, and actually, I have to take my hat off to Neil that uh, put up our poly tunnels. I asked him if he could come and plough our poly tunnels for us. Um, and, with, and he said he'd never ploughed a poly tunnel before, but he'd give it a go. But with his Fergie, with the hot exhaust sitting up in the air, he wasn't allowed to stop whilst he was inside the poly tunnel. Um, so he had to dive in through the door, drop the plough, drive through without stopping and out through a small door at the other end without burning a hole in the plastic or taking his head off. Um, and he managed to do it very well indeed. Um, so after, over the last 12 years, we've kind of developed the croft predominantly as a, for, for vegetable growing. Um, half, of the, half of the croft we've planted up with, with a productive woodland. Um, so that's about 20 acres. Um, and we've got productive ground of another about 20 acres as well, which we've subdivided into six fields. Um, partly so we could put hedges around them. We're at elevation of about 600 foot um, and we've been a particularly wind location. So we thought that shelter was a priority. Planted two kilometers of hedgerow and about 22,000 trees. in the woodland as apples out of that which was which was fantastic um, we grow on a bed system most of our veg um, so we grow we use I was today I was just saying when we got started out I've been laying about five kilometers of biodegradable corn starch mulch um, to form veg beds uh, in our fields and then we grow our own transplants and transplant them through that, um, predominantly by, by hand. Um, and this year we're growing about 135,000 transplants. Um, so they get seeded into modules, grown on in a polytunnel, and then planted out um, into beds by, by hand. 
Uh, we also use MyPEX sheets with holes burned through them, a bit like Anna and Hannah were showing, um, for doing closer space to things uh, like herbs and, and, and baby leaf lettuce uh, and, and so on. Um, and I have to say that we've, I've been amazed by the variety and the range of things that we've been able to grow, actually. Um, a lot of people told me that we'd you know, be quite limited given our altitude, um, but actually the range of things that we've managed to grow is, 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 is great. We've, I mean, we produced, last year we produced about 4,000 head of fennel, um, which was really popular. Um, and also we've, I've been trying for six years to grow outdoor sweet corn um, and I've failed for the last five years. Um, but last year we, we actually imported some seed from a research station in Alaska um, and their, 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 their sweet corn seed was basically timed to fit in with the longer day length that we have in the summer at this latitude. And we actually got 3,000 head of sweet corn grown outside, which was, which was fantastic, very popular with our customers. Um, in terms of marketing, um, the main thing that we're doing at the moment is veg boxes. So we've, uh, currently we've got about 200 um, local customers who we deliver to door to door fortnightly. Um, but we have tried quite a number of other things um, as, we've, as we've developed the business. Uh, we started off just doing farmers markets for the first two years, uh, partly because I was still working, but also because we want basically the farmers market. market you turn up with what you got and quantity to, to serve all your customers and that took us some some time to feel that we were confident enough to do that um, we've also had a couple of wholesale cust uh, customers over over the years as well for three years we held a contract jointly with another croft to supply organic lettuce um, into the highland council school meal service which we ran for, th for three years um, went out to all of their school kitchens and probably didn't get eaten by the kids because it wasn't as tasty as baked beans um, and and that was interesting. Um, not sure I'd do it again, but it was interesting going through the process of bidding for a public contract um, and distributes working with a local um, Swanson's local um, Inverness based distributor to get to get the produce out. And also for two winters, we had a contract with Ocado in London where we were sending 1200 bags of baby leaf kale down to their robotic um, pick and pack house in, in London. Um, and that again, learned some lessons from that. Um, we got a bit bored of picking bags of kale. Um, and also when, when, um, when Ocado found a cheaper um, supplier, they, they asked us to cut our price by 30%. Um, and when we said no, they stopped our contract the next week. Um, so we've, we've come back to just working with a local market basically, because they are more reliable um, and they're a bit friendlier. Um, and they, um, we get to speak to all inspectors know and speak to customers which, which we really like um, in terms of range of produce we've got well we used to have five polytunnels um, four of them blew away in a storm in um, 2014 so we just got one polytunnel at the moment which we use for propagation and for, for sort of Mediterranean veg in the in the summer um, and baby leaf um, salads in, in in the winter, we a duodoc boar, um, and we finish about 35 pigs a year. Um, we had a bit of a panic a couple of years ago um, when the butchers found that we, they weren't a local butcher wasn't able to do our butchery for us. So we uh, very quickly um, had to build ourselves a butchery unit on the croft, which we've now done, and we do all the butchery uh, in house which is good but it's quite a lot of additional expense and paperwork and, and worry um, that goes goes with some of that um, and we also do some processing as well so we do jams we do um, um, fresh pesto we do cordials uh, we do apple juice um, and then with the pork we do we do sausages burgers bacon uh, hams pork pies basically anything anything you can you can do with a pig basically um, and the pigs predominantly we got, we didn't really intend to get pigs actually, but we needed to clear the, we needed to clear the ground. Uh, we're organic certified um, and we needed to clear the ground of veg at the end of the season, of the first season and suddenly realized we hadn't got a way of doing that. So we got some pigs um, and it's turned out that they've been, they're very popular with our customers. Our veg box customers um, can add any of our, we've got about 50 different products that we, we offer now and our, ve our veg box customers can add those to their, to their regular uh, order. Um, and that's where we do a lot of selling our, our added value products. Um, 
in terms of the veg boxes, we we COVID's kind of been the making of our business in some ways. Um, insofar as the all the farmers, we used to do about sixty or seventy farmers markets a year. Um, all of that stopped um, just over two years ago. Um, but then everybody and their granny wanted a veg box. And we were listed about 100 for, for several years, and we've doubled that over the last two years up, up to just the farmer's markets. We are going back to some of the markets. I was just chatting with Russell earlier. We're going to go back to the Dornoch market. Um, and the markets are, they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, they're also a lot of work. Um, but for us, they're kind of a shop window where we, where we have our veg box customers um, is basically where we've been to farmers markets. People come and try us, chat to us, and if they want to get something regularly, then they, they sign up for a delivery. Um, and our delivery areas, we go, we cover locally around um, Dingwall, um, Strathpeffer area. Um, we also cover Black Isle. We have a run that goes up to Dornoch and Tain. And then on the West Coast, we have a run, run that goes out to Gerloch and up, up to Ullapool as well. Um, and actually, I for several years I told we used to go to the Pool U market, and I told our customers for several years they were saying every winter, when how are we going to get your veg? Are you going to um, come over and do a run? And I said I hadn't got enough customers. And one day, one of my veg box, one of our market regulars, called my bluff and said, "Well, how many people would you need to make it worth doing a run over to come and deliver your veg boxes to it?" So, so I just plucked a figure out at the air and everyone knew to a customer, and I said, "I need thirty people." And she turned up at the market the next week and she got a list of 42 people who have all signed up to get a veg box. So we, we had to start delivering veg boxes over on the West. But it's it's good. It's nice. It's good customer. And I have to say, East Coast people are fussier customers and West Coast people are much more appreciative of what they've what they, what they given. Um, in, terms, in terms of the team, um, we kind of, I guess we're following a business model, which is kind of an American model called community supported agriculture. So we do quite a bit of outreach. Um, and the community support, a part of, of, of what we do is basically our customers have to sign up for a season and they have to stick with us. And that's the only way that we can plant stuff in the ground and make an investment and know that they're going to take it. I'm not, we're not interested in customers who just want to take things just at Christmas or just, you know, just when they're feeling like it. It's, we want regular people who support us uh, through the year. Um, we also have an arrangement. We have a um, option with it. We have 150 laying hens. And we have an option um, with our veg box customers that they can they can uh, donate veg boxes and they can donate uh, eggs to the to the food bank in in Inverness and that's really good myself um, my partner Lorna part-time um, one worker four days a week year round and then we take on two seasonal workers each year and quite a few of those who've worked with us have then gone on to set up their own their own businesses we've also as Russell mentioned we used work away uh, volunteers for about three years as well um, and we only pay minimum wage um, but they get paid more, more than I do um, our, our workers um, and we have, we've also built a, uh, we've got a caravan and we've also built a flat in our, in our agricultural shed because I don't know what it's like in other parts of the Highlands, but trying to find affordable accommodation for workers on minimum wage, is just not possible. Basically, we've got to provide accommodation for people if they're going to come, come and work with us. Um, and finally, in terms of numbers, um, I was asked to say a little bit about this. This is a slightly complex table. Um, but if you, basically, if you go down to the bottom line in the middle, um, with our turnover from our veg from, from our veg boxes and from our farmers markets and from our, a little bit of wholesales as well to a few places comes to about 118,000 pounds a year, which I think off a 45 acre croft at 600 um, foot is pretty good actually. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that we managed to produce that much that much food. Uh, constantly staggers me. Um, if you go up to the next lineup, that's the good news is that's our turnover. The, the, the next lineup is my profit is to 228 pounds a year. Um, but the profit does it that does include in the profit I, I am including in our costs our depreciation so we've made quite a significant capital investment both ourselves and through grant aid um, and we are covering the cost of depreciation so each year we're basically investing about ten thousand pounds back into the business to do things like build a butchery when suddenly the, the butcher can't do the work for you anymore or buy a new delivery van um, those those sorts of things um, but if you go to the top of the table the outputs of what we do 
um, of some of the things that we're not getting paid for. So we, we have a carbon budget on the, on the Croft, I'm a bit of a carbon geek, and um, currently we're carbon negative by 72 tonnes. So we're emitting 40 tonnes of carbon every year. Um, but through a combination of tree planting, increase in soil organic matter, composting and a whole bunch of other things, we're soaking up 112 tonnes of carbon every year on the Croft. So we are carbon negative uh, by 72 tonnes a year. Um, unfortunately, the market doesn't pay me for that at the moment. Um, and I would like to be paid for that. I think that we're providing, you know, on our Croft, we are providing the social service of soaking up carbon and that we should get paid, paid for that. Um, in terms of jobs, we're creating 3.2 jobs, if you average it out over the whole year. Um, and we're paying those people the, the, the working, um, the minimum wage, the agricultural wage. But you know, if you look at what HIE um, on average spends to support a job in a remote rural area, then we, if we were HIE, then they'd be giving themselves £16,000 to create those and maintain those jobs in those areas. And we provide a healthy diet um, to about 200 families. Um, they're paying the, the, the social, they're paying the market value of the food, but they're not paying the social value of the health benefits of having a, having a healthy diet um, and cooking from scratch. And there's a various ways of um, estimating uh, what the value of that might be. Um, so the next line down, the one, the only one I haven't touched on is subsidy. We get very little um, basic payment scheme. Um, we don't get any less um, LFAS um, because that only applies to ruminant animals. Um, and I think we're more, dis more less favoured for growing um, lettuces. Um, and we get a little bit of aches. We get, we're certified as organic, so we get the minimum £500 a year, which just covers our certification costs through the maintenance scheme. And we get a little bit of farm woodland premium under that. Um, but in total, I think value on our croft is £38,000. Um, and... You know, as yeah. cap reform, cap is being replaced by co, co, post cap, I would like us to be as Croft as paid for that. And then I would actually make, make a living because for the last 12 years, I've basically been working on wage running and setting up this business. Um, it's giving us a nice place to live. It's giving us nice food. It's enabling us to reinvest in our business. But I actually haven't taken a penny of cash out of, out of, out of the business yet. Okay. That's about it. That's Excellent, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, we'll take questions and all these other things at the end, which I'm um, either saving them up or put them in the chat room. And we can go straight on to Donald then. Donald from the Western Isles completing our coverage of the Highlands and Islands. Best of all, top a lot, Russell. Come on, you, you said Western Isles. You've got to be much more specific than that. From yes. next. <laughs> West Lewis. Yes. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting um, listening to everybody else's uh, businesses and ideas. And I think it's always good to look at other people's businesses and visit other businesses because you get loads of ideas from that and uh, kind of sparks your own ideas. Um, I don't have a presentation for you. I have just been elected as a councillor and I have been... Um, uh, be, I've been nice to people for the past month, uh, you know, in the build up to the election and stuff. So I have very little capacity to be nice to people just now. You, none of you guys are voting for me now, so I'm, I'm not I'm not going to be overly nice to you. Um, so I'm in Ness in the north end of Lewis, a traditional crofting family. Uh, I am in my grandparents house right now, which I now own. And I'm looking out on I've got three crofts next to each other here. Uh, use about 10 crofts in total. Um, crofts here are about a big croft in the north end of Lewis is seven acres. Um, I think on my BPS, I've got 22 hectares of uh, region one, something like that. Um, so that's with all the, all the crofts that I use. Uh, mainly, it's, it's all livestock, actually. I'm saying mainly livestock. But there are, there are almost three different markets that, that, I, that I go for. I've been crofting all my life, but I've been doing it full time since 2017. I, I had been um, balancing it. Uh, I can't remember who said it. Maybe it was the the first uh, the first speaker. I can't remember his name. Sorry, who said that? You know, you, you're you're earning an income from from the job, but um, is that stopping you from from expanding your business? And I I thought that I used to work for the council, and I had the safety net of a monthly wage. 
and I thought, right, I can, I'm going to gamble and lose that safety net, and it's going to make me, uh, it's going to force me to to make the business make some money. So I've been doing it full time five years, supplementing it a little bit with um, media income, doing stuff for BBC All Up and things like that. But the Croft has had to um, wash its own face. Uh, at, at the very least so and i was saying i've got three different markets that i go for so uh i had i've had up to about 800 hens on two different holdings so i say we've got different crofts here so you can have up to 350 or 349 hens or something on one holding without going to the next level of bureaucracy so uh i had 349 and never over 350 on, on one holding. So I, next door to each other, maybe 20, 30 meters apart, 350 there, 350 there. Um, and then you could, so I'm selling these and it was pretty good. That's that's uber local. That's just, you know, in, in Lewis and Harris, a lot of them are, are just sold in the shops just all around me. Um, but the bird flu lockdowns of the last couple of winters have been an absolute nightmare for the kind of, I mean, it's it's a small it's it's small scale when you look at the grand scheme of UK wide, but here it's it's you know it's it's big scale. But the the it's been really difficult. I think the, the bird flu lockdown. So I'm winding down the the egg side of things, and that's why that's why I stood for election in the in the in the council. Pure. Uh, it, it, it is still making a profit. Um, one of the best things I did for uh, the financial side of things is that I use software. Um, so I've got, I use zero financial software and that le lets me, just while people were talking there, I logged in, checked, what have I spent on um, chicken feed in the, in, the, in, the, in the last financial year and what did I make? So there's a profit of about six, seven grand there. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's other things like you know I have to take fuel into account and um, egg boxes and things, but the vast, vast, vast majority, like ninety percent of it, is going to be um, is going to be the the, the feed in, in terms of the costs. So that is the the market locally, and I remember when I was doing a wee bit of preparatory work before I before I went down for it where it went in for a probably, and I'm, I'm seeing questions about. The organic certification and is it worth going down the organic route and somebody said to me oh go down the organic route um you know you'll be able to charge a premium for it but that's where you have to know your market you know if i, I we were discussing just before everybody else joined us before the price of feed hen feed here has gone up to i think it's 12 pound 80 for a 12 uh, 20 kilogram bag so my eggs retail in the shops now for three pound per half dozen and this is an economy where there are luxury item there that's just you know these are your bog standard eggs and people treat them as bog standard eggs they'll go they'll they'll accommodate a little bit um you know to to support a local business but uh, as somebody pointed out to me there's a fine line between necessity and luxury so they're still they're bordering on been a necessity just now but you know it's what what makes them a luxury and and wh why would they be a luxury so there's there's that that element to it so that's the eggs and that's the the very very local side of things um livestock are, are my 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 main passion uh sheep cattle and pigs and i found myself in the last few years going more and more towards low input low output so highland cattle uh, Hebridean Shetland sheep, blackface sheep. I've also got your commercial use, so like Texel crosses, Suffolk, and things like that. So what I do is with the sheep side of things, there's there's two sides to it. There's the there's the side that I um, give them creep feed, and I get the big lambs, and I try and finish as many as I can myself. Maybe twenty, maybe about twenty a year. Uh, not not huge numbers. Uh, but I'll try and finish about 20 a year and sell them uh, direct to customers. I do nearly all my marketing via uh, social media. Uh, I, I, I I have my own program on BBC Alaba, which is good for, uh, you know, following me on the Croft and it's good for raising my profile. Um, so I do get a bit of following that way. But Facebook in particular has been really good for, for selling things, uh, particularly locally. But I think I've got about uh between five five and a half thousand followers on on uh, on facebook and about 
I think it's it's come, it's, it's approaching ten thousand on Twitter. Um, so I'm able to sell things via social media. That's in the in the blink of an eye, you can you can reach all these people. Um, what has been really important for me is is telling my story. What is the difference between my product and the products that other people are selling here? Not much, really. You know, if you did a blind taste test, would we be able to tell the difference between between things? Possibly, possibly not. But it's it's my story that I'm that I'm selling as much as anything else. So the story that goes along with it is important. So if your story is good and your product is good, brilliant. If your story is good and your product is is crap, not not great. You'll still sell some. But if your if your product is brilliant and your story is rubbish, nobody's going to know about you. Nobody's going to nobody's going to buy your stuff and you're and you're left with all all those products. So the the story that goes alongside it. I think is 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 really important. Uh, so that's that that's the 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 sheep side of things. Pigs and beef, easy to sell for me. Uh, I I can sell. I used what I used to do was I would take pre-orders, and uh, I can only sell half pig carcasses, for example, because um, butcher sheep, there's no capacity in the butcher here to um, to 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 package label things properly they won't they, they just won't do it so it's kind of a gray area um uh hopefully there's nobody from uh, environmental health here but you know you 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 will find a butcher the butcher will do it and um yeah if they are from an environmental health member i'm a counselor now as well <laughs> but uh you know it is it is kind of that 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 there's a gray area there and, and it's, it's selling it as a as a as a as a half or a, or a whole carcass uh but pork sells really well. What I did last year was um, I just put a post on Facebook, maybe after the animals had gone to the slaughterhouse, confident that I that 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 they'd go. And yeah, within um, within within a couple of days, everything everything's gone. So that worked well. The the only thing that didn't work well was my boar last year. So I didn't have as many uh, as many as many wieners as I as I usually do. So that that was down a little bit um but yeah and then and then the beef the same thing it's it's one or two beasts a year just now hopefully this year i'll have six calves because i'm quite new to cattle um and yeah it's about the story that goes along with the cattle I, I, i've been using geofence geofencing collars no fence collars on my cattle so i'm able to have more cattle that are out on the moor 50,000 acres of, of moorland here. Uh, so I'm able, I'm, I'm going to up the cattle numbers and manage them. And I can sit here on my phone and uh, and I can check where my cattle are and manage them. So it's about saving my time as well. Time is money. So on my phone, I can manage my whole business in terms of the accountancy, the accountancy software. I can manage my livestock in terms of uh, where they are and are they okay? So things like that make it more efficient, make it easier for me. And if I'm over in Stornoway or if I'm on the mainland or something, I can still run things remotely from 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 wherever I am. Uh, I suppose the one thing that's a little bit different for me is is I I do have a a wide a wide uh, audience that I I can tap into. Um, and I, I was talking about the three tiers of customers. So you've got your local, um, like for the eggs. Uh, there is very little market in Lewis for lamb. People in Lewis, there's, there's an oversupply of lamb or mutton in Lewis. So I don't bother trying to sell it here. There's just there's just no point. Uh, I, I can sell it, you know, overseas. I can sell it to you people on the mainland. Um, so that, that that's worked quite well. I use Royal Mail next day delivery. I try and keep things under 15. I try and do a box of under 15 kilograms. And uh, I can send that next day delivery. The I just take it to my local post office where it leaves here at eleven a.m. And the you know the, the the best example I've got is left here at eleven a.m. And the half lamb was in Norfolk at nine a.m. the next morning. So that works really well. Able to access a, a good a good um, a good market that way. And it's just about it's about selling it's about having the right product and you know you, you you can sell it for more you can you can how do I package that to send the Royal Mail well it's, there's, there's, I'm just seeing a question there so the, the two options I have been using wool cool um, so cardboard box with 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 a wool kind of 
uh, food grade packaging. Using that, um, I do. I don't send it. it. It all goes fresh. And the other, the other box, the other box I use are the kind of the polystyrene boxes that they use for um, packaging salmon. So there's there's lots of. Uh, there's lots of lots of salmon production over in Stornoway, and and they've got we've got Polybox who, who can manufacture all these boxes. So everything is everything I do is fresh. Um, the our slaughterhouse is only open from August till uh, Christmas, so um, that kind of it kind of means it's it's in the quieter months for me. There's no there's no pressure to do it in the summer in the height of summer. It'd be great if it was because then you could sell it. You could sell more of the of the the lamb, for example. I th I reckon tourists would would buy lamb in the summer months, but it's not it's not viable. It'd probably be hogget or mutton that I would that I would be able to sell in the in the summer months. But that's just it's just a non-starter. I'd have to send them to Dingwall and get them back, and with the with the the the, the scale, uh, it just wouldn't be commercially viable to do that. My own local, I can see my own local butcher shop out the window here just now, uh, and I was supplying them, but they would sometimes take half a lamb carcass over for ten days, and you know and, and it's it, it it was just very very difficult to 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 manage that, but. That's the that's kind of the three tiers of of, uh, of of customer the very very local ones, the 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 ones who are going to to um, going to buy like island wide and then nationally. That's that's the, that's the different ones. Who are you selling to? Lamb I am at selling to kind of like West End Glasgow people who got a lot of money who like the the story that goes along with it. Um, you know the, these these kind of these kind of people they 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 they, they lap it up and uh they, they don't question the the prices that that you charge so it's got to be commercially viable that way um is the whole thing commercially viable well i've been doing it five years it's more and more challenging just now and the, the increase in feed costs is a concern as is the the squeeze on everybody else if people have uh less disposable income i'm not as confident that they're going to be paying you know that extra extra money on, on on things so it it really is a concern which is kind of like why i've I, I, and one of the reasons why 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 i stood for council just to make sure i've got uh you know a, a, an income for the for the next five years um so yeah it's 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 selling to the right know who you're selling to selling to the right people selling it the right way and uh yeah that's that's pretty much all, all I've, uh, all I've got to say. I'm just one thing. I've just answered a question on the geofence. You work for the sheep. Uh, it's not. It's, it's like three hundred quid for our geofence for the cattle. It's the same price for the sheep. So it's not. It's not really um, viable unless you've only got one or two. But I did get cags for the for the collars. So I, I, uh, I was the first person to apply for cags for that, and and that works there. So that's me. Good. Thank you very much, Donald. That was yeah, but. Uh... Yeah, a different tack in that. I think all our five presenters have done very well and, you know, different angles and different things from different parts of the country. So there's yeah, a good coverage of all sorts of things there. Uh, there's a few questions in the chat room, um, which we'll go through some of them. And if you do have anything else you want to say, as I say, go for the, uh, was it the reactions button and raise your hand, and then we'll pick it up from that. But I just wanted, before we go to some of that, pick up on your point about abattoirs there, and you've got an abattoir in Lewis, which makes meat quite, you know, it's, a, it's possible for you. I don't know how you get on, Beth, with your animals and abattoirs, because it's a big thing for a lot of people. If you don't have a local abattoir, then you know selling meat becomes hugely more difficult. Beth, do you want to come in on that? Um, it is becoming more difficult to get beasts in because we at least have between Granton and Dingwall. Um, so in um, right at the start of lockdown, Dingwall um suddenly got an influx of doing their own meat because a lot of people suddenly wanted to buy local meat. Um, however, Granton bases these mostly on restaurants, so they suddenly had a lull. So we did have that back up, um, but it is getting harder to book beasts into Dingwall 
um, because they will only take it a week in advance. Um, but it, so far, at least for us, we're fairly fortunate at having two. Um, and even though we have, a, in a sense, a preference, it still means we are pretty fortunate, but it is a lot harder. And how, it, how the way forward is, I have no idea. More loop laboratories is the way forward, yeah. Right, so he ask his hand up. We'll take one or two of the more questions from the chat room first. I think Donald answered some of the questions about organic certification. I don't know if any of our other presenters want to come in on that. Yeah, we, I mean, we've been organic certified from the start, just a personal choice, really. Um, and we, it's not the prime we, place way that we're describing our food i mean fresh and local is 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 the this the main thing and we don't really blast it everywhere that we're organic um but it's quite reassuring if somebody asks you about how you produce things you can you can state that it's organic and they makes them feel a bit happier basically um but it does provide the challenge somebody's asking is it worth certification cost and you can get the certification costs through if you if under AICS um, through the, the through the organic maintenance scheme. The additional cost really comes in buying buying inputs which are organic certified, um, and often most of the main suppliers um, in our parts don't have um, organic supplies, so we're having to buy things in an additional transport cost. So that's really where the additional cost is. But it's it's not the it's not the the main question. It's not the burning question that. Um, a customer will ask you first. It's really about where are you and what do you produce and how is it produced. All right, thank you. And someone else was asking at the beginning about insurances, uh, public liability and employee liability. Is there anything else? I think, Jake, you have people coming onto your prof. Do you have anything special covering that? Uh, just tell them not to fall in ditches or poke their eyes out with uh, stakes. Uh, yeah, that's been our approach so far. Probably if we do more, we should look into it. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's my advice so far. Right. Make sure your public liability is up to date and of a suitable amount. Um, we had a bit of an issue. We had a bit of an issue just on insurance last year, and that we've been on the. The croft extension to our property basically uh, to cover our, our croft business and nfu mutual told us that basically that we weren't covered um for what we were doing um and that we've been they wanted to move us onto a farm policy and that's a that's a huge step up um in in premium cover um and i had, I had to chat with patrick about 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 this um so i think you know as, as small businesses Croft businesses become more diverse and start offering a range of different things. Maybe it's would be worth going back to NFU Mutual and saying, you know, could we could could we have a Croft policy that's you know a, a premium policy that we pay a bit more, but it it covers us rather than because basically otherwise what happens is you end up paying twice once once for your property and then once to set up as a farm business insurance. So I do think it might be worth to try and negotiate a, a, a better deal for NFU that covers the sorts of things that we've been talking about tonight. I, I would say to try and find someone as well as NFU, because we dropped our insurance costs by two thirds, leaving NFU. They were getting up to three grand a year, for NFU. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. Our house is slightly more expensive with the new people, but the Croft is a lot less. And I know NFU pay 97% of claims. So they're great to deal with when you're making a claim. But can you justify that when it's two grand a year of extra costs? Well, I, we can't. We can't justify that. So, yeah, we've just left them as well. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, that's uh, yeah. You 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 heard it from people who are involved in, in the business, right? Donald, you and then you get your hand up, sitting there patiently. Okay. Uh, yeah. Th thanks, Russell. I mean. All of these presentations have been absolutely inspirational. And, and you know, many, many thanks to, to all the folk here. Um, abattoirs, and uh, mainly, uh, I guess, directed to Sweeney, you know, is, is, is uh, 
um, congratulations on being on the Corla and uh, now having an influence on the uh, the management of the Stornoway Abattoir. But but what 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 would be his advice? Um, you know, to those of us that that, that don't have access to, uh, or easy access to an abattoir, uh, the the. The 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 Corla manages to 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 avoid many many regulations and and uh, on, on on the basis of uh, market failure and remoteness. Um, I wonder wonder how we could get around these issues in uh, in Sky and other uh, you know remote areas and highlands. Any advice on that? If I, if I can come in, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think the market is going to uh, is going to cover you there. Basically, uh, in the Western Isles, the Corla, the Western Isles Council, um, they run the the slaughterhouse and store away. To be honest, I'm not 100 percent sure what what the what the deal is right now with Barra and uh, North US. There are two other slaughterhouses yeah. there, which. Um, I'm not sure if they're open just now, but I, I again, this is me speaking as a crofter. I'm, this is not me as a councillor, but my understanding was before that they were only viable with some subsidy from from the council as well. So um, yeah, I, I I reckon that the only the only way it's going to work is if there is some um, some support from the public sector. Uh, the argument here is that if the the council didn't didn't support the the the, the slaughterhouse and keep it open, then you would have people going back to mass home killings, you know, and there'd be an, an, an environmental health issue there with disposal, um, with disposal of uh, of of you know waste product. Um, so I'm seeing that the the the, the Baras slaughterhouse is open um, still. So yeah, I I, I think that. Um, that uh, yeah, that it's only viable with a, with support from the public sector. Um, there was our our slaughterhouse was opened originally by a cooperative. Um, it was Heather Isles Meats, I think they were called originally about 20, 25 years ago, something like that. Um, so yeah, the, the, I I I think I think that you've you've got to go down that route rather than 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 wait for something commercial because the, the private the private sector w w it won't work. Good, thanks for that. Uh, there's questions in the chat room about generally about regulations and health and all sorts of things. Some vulgar plug here just now. For the Scottish Crofting Federation, you can see that, produces a book called The Horticulture, a handbook for crofters, which covers some stuff about vegetables, a lot about growing, a lot of very good information can be tailored to the, let's say, the, the harsher grounds of the North and the West. But gen regulations in general, does anyone want to come on that? Sandra, do we as SCF know stuff about it? And can we advise? Well, we've help? been looking into it on behalf of um, a member. And all I can say is it's not really very easy to find out a, um, a straightforward answer. I've been speaking to Beth about it as well, and she managed to find me some bits of information, but the best advice seems to be to speak to your local environmental health officer. And they should be able to keep you right. But it, it, it's a bit of a minefield of information out there when you're trying to find out. Um, I can see Isabella has agreed. So that's why she asked the question. Um, I've found it very difficult to find a straightforward answer. I have emailed Highland Council as well last week, and I'm, I'm still waiting for a, a response. So if I, if I can f follow up on that as well. Um... My experience has, has been that environmental health here anyway were, were very, very helpful. Um, uh, I, I, I obviously I, I had my premises approved for um, the egg packing side of things. and when i when I started, first of all, I naively assumed that I was I was okay for food production. and it wasn't until 
uh, I was shown on TV packaging sausages in my uh, egg packing station that I got an email from my environmental health officer saying, uh, shouldn't be doing that. So yeah, that's uh, the, one of the downsides as well of, uh, of a profile is that um, you can be, you can have your knuckles wrapped for things. And, uh, but yeah, I, um, speak, speak to your environmental health, your local environmental health officer, and they'll, they'll keep you right. Cause at the end of the day, they're the ones who are going to pass or fail you. We had, I know in, in the very early days of the Dornock Farmers Market that we actually had a meeting and we got an environmental health officer along to talk to a whole bunch of people at the same time. And that, that worked well. A lot of stuff about labelling, about food hygiene, uh, about the quantities you could sell things in, the need for proper scales and all that kind of thing. Anyway, Donald, give me a hand up. Yep, yep, yep. Um, to totally agree on that. If uh, the, the the main thing, first and foremost, is is register with the local authority as a food producer. That's a simple form. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, and 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 then if in doubt, if in doubt, speak to them because they are helpful, and uh, they're not going to shoot you down. Thanks. Anyone else want to come in on that? Anyone who has been shot down or, is, um, or have they generally been helpful? Well, as I said in the comments there, um, I, I have not found them helpful at all. Um, and uh, yeah, my very first visit, she was making noises about, oh, you know, I, I, I don't want to have to come back and uh, close you down. Um, you know, this is a first visit when really you're just looking for help and guidance. Um, and I was talking to somebody else in Lewis the other day, trying to find out from them what they had in place um, to, to comply with environmental health regulations, to sell veg, this was, sorry. And, uh, and he was like, well, I'm only just starting out too. I, I've not done the, the, the HACCP plan. Your, your booklet for all your your risks so i'm like well you know how can somebody in lewis be selling veg boxes if uh, when i when i'm getting threatened with being shut down here so no i think there's a huge huge need for some help really for people out there we've got better counselors in lewis uh, <laughs> <laughs> i'm moving then donald <laughs> I, I there, did, there did used to be help available. Um, HIE, when they used to help small businesses rather than just big ones, um, did have a did have a call off contract with a with a food safety advisor, uh, Hazel Gordon, and you could go to her and get independent advice on all of these things and um, a couple of days of her time to put together your HACCP plans, and it was a really useful publicly funded service that enabled people to not feel that they were taking undue risks when faced with bureaucracy, which is designed really for very large businesses, not for small businesses like ours. So I think, you know, we should go back to HIE and we should go back to Scotland Food and Drink and say that, you know, one of the enabling things they can do um, in the Highlands is to off offer a free service to, to help them through some of this paperwork because it's, you know, is every small business has to has to get through it, and we don't. Not, and it's a it's a significant um, worry right, for a lot of new producers that I that I speak to certainly. Is are you taking a note of that, Patrick? So it's yeah, uh, that, that is something the SCF we, we we can take up. But I think what we're seeing is that there is a great variety or you know, the environmental health officers over the country. And this is something we see with our departments as well, that you know, some are very good and helpful, other areas are not. And I won't name and shame people just now, but you know, it's, I, I don't know what we do about that sort of variation. It should be consistent across the country and they should all be helpful. Um, Never ask, never suggest you EHA you want to do something fermented. That was the only mistake I've ever really made. Was we, we they, they're happy with all of our butchery, but when we started talking about salamis, then they seem to have a, an allergy to anything that's been that's been fermented. So we've just you can only buy them under the counter if you want one. Ask. Yeah. Um, I think we've got a couple of 
Okay, there was, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, as much more we can say about that just now, but we will follow up on that. One other question, which was in the chat room, was for Joe and was about the, the, the fact that you're uh, driving around a lot, delivering stuff, where is the cutoff point that that stops becoming viable? I mean, yeah, I good question. I saw I saw that question, um, and I thought somebody was reading the inside of my brain. The, I mean, well, to take a slightly different angle on that, the the two largest carbon leakages in our in our uh, croft business are diesel in our delivery vans and feed for our pigs. Um, so both those are kind of top of my list of bad things that we might need to do something about. Um, one of them is we have got an electric delivery vehicle, but it doesn't really go far enough to reach all of our customers. Um, and I guess the other point is I hadn't really imagined when we started a business that we would have to go that 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 far distance to serve some of our some of our customers. Um, and I think that points to the fact that there's still not a, a good way for customers to find local food. Um, I think I I don't know about other people, but I feel that the the barriers that I face are not about producing food they're actually about distribution about getting it to the customers cost effectively because you know in the food and fruit and veg for instance you know swanson's and williamson's the two main wholesalers they just don't carry local food and they don't pay a pre want to present a premium product so we're not using the usual distribution channels we basically have all got to invent our own distribution system and then that's very small scale and efficient and we're driving around in circles so I think it points to a slightly bigger issue, which is which is how do we, yeah, you know, there's a massive, I've seen a massive change in the last five years of people looking for local food and a lot of lot of customers who are frustrated by the fact that they don't, they can't get hold of local food in, in their shop um, or in their co-op um, or through the wholesaler or, or, or anywhere else. And I think kind of the, you know, I don't want to do that many miles and emit that, emit that much carbon, but we, we need to replace it with a system that we could all present several of our products together and people could find an easier way of getting it, picking it up or delivered or presented in their local shop. I think it's, it's a distribution problem. Yeah. Uh, yes, to it, to it uh, a problem we will not solve um, this evening. Was was there not something in Sky a few years ago where it was a bit like a a, a van that went round delivering lots of different um, lots of different producers stuff? Yeah, I, I think there was something near Sky or on Sky. I heard it mentioned in a in a business uh, local um, chamber of commerce meeting last week. I think that was still or is still operating. I think Donald might know about that, the Studlink van. Right, you're still muted, Donald. Sorry, the, the food link van is still on the go, yes. And 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 uh, you, you, you can look it up online and uh, and, and you can subscribe to it and, uh, you know, the charge a percentage and uh, it's um, very well used, I think. Yeah, we've, we've been approached by quite a few businesses on the North Coast 500 who would like to have local food in for sale, either in their shop or in their B&B or their restaurant. Um, but we've said no to them all because of the distribution issues a, a, attached to that. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of businesses, businesses who are buying in wholesale products to, 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 to add to their, to their um, largely tourism food offer. Um, and they want to take a, you know, a range of different produce, meat and, and cheese and um, veg and processed foods, then, you know, there needs to be a hub somewhere. There needs to be somewhere where people, where a business could go for a range of different different products. Because at the moment, it's 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 difficult for them as purchasers because they've got to make individual arrangements with individual suppliers. Um, yeah, maybe one thing is we can all um, 
going to our local shops and say, why aren't you selling more local produce? Well, that was my dead silence. Uh, any other questions? Right. Do you want to say anything, Patrick, about maybe getting events on environmental health, or is that something that we will want to look at? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look, I'll look into that. It's, it's, it's um, an obvious follow up one to this, isn't it? Is um, let's have a meeting with an environmental health officer and, and, and maybe some other regulatory people involved as well. Because it, it's something that people are worried about, evidently. Yeah, but watch this space. Good. Some something positive out of this. Uh, any more questions? We're overrun our stated time, but that's not a problem if uh, people have things they want to raise up. Please bring up. No. Right, in which case I will thank all the speakers even the ones who have gone already, Hannah, Hannah and Anna are going to put the children to bed. Um, but thank you to everyone else. Thank you for people att attending and for your questions and comments. Uh, the recording will be available, Sandra, will it? If anyone wants to catch up on any of the presentations at the time or, uh, or for people who registered but didn't attend, We'll have the link in the e-newsletter for sure um, at the end of the month. Good. Well, in which case, I will again thank you all for coming and thank you to the, especially the presenters. And have a good rest of the evening. I will go and see if my large sheep has lambed and feed the dogs. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Cheers. Thank you very much, Russell. Thanks for chairing it. Absolutely. Really good.